Good afternoon, everyone. Before beginning, I'd like to acknowledge the late David Rockefeller, whom, as you know, was the founder of this council and who passed away recently. His leadership will be greatly missed, I'm sure, here and in the many other organizations with which I was familiar with his activities. But I thank you for inviting me to speak at the 47th Annual Washington Conference so I can share some details about the administration's trade policy. Our trade policy is one of the keys to our efforts to promote growth and innovation. The other keys are regulatory reform, energy reform, and tax reform. Most of those take all kinds of legislation. Trade so far hasn't taken a lot and very likely won't until we make some new free trade agreements. Our goal is to increase overall trade while reducing our trade deficit. We do not seek a trade war with anyone, least of all with our fellow citizens of the Americas. Our relationships with the West, within the Western Hemisphere are of very great importance to us. I'm happy to remind you, as many of you here know, that I've done very good business over the years with many of the countries represented here and often have visited others as a tourist. And my sister and brother-in-law have been very active in the Knights and Dames of Malta and in that connection have helped build houses for the poor in many of the countries represented here. I also have very many good friends throughout the region as well as many expats from the Americas who live full or part-time in Florida or New York. So I feel very, very comfortable with this audience. It may be one of the few truly bipartisan audiences I encounter here in Washington. But President Trump succinctly summed up our trade policy to me recently. He said, if there is a new trilateral with Canada and Mexico, it should be spelled differently, should have two Fs, N-A-F-F, TA, with the extra F standing for FAIR. This standard will be applied across the Americas and across the globe. Step one is enforcement. We are going to implement stricter enforcement than any recent administration. We will be diligent in pursuing violative imports and in collecting anti-dumping and countervailing duties. Recently, this was reflected in our preliminary determination in the Canadian softwood lumber case. This was based on the facts presented, not on political considerations. We've made clear that if any Canadian or British Columbian official wishes to present additional information, we will consider it carefully and impartially, but threats of retaliatory action are inappropriate and will not influence any final determinations. We continue to believe that a negotiated settlement is in the best interest of all the parties, and we're prepared to work toward that end. Similarly, we also continue to bring together all interested parties regarding Mexican sugar imports into the U.S. Unfortunately, our efforts there to reach a negotiated solution have so far come to a bit of an impasse. But still, next week, I will be joined by my Mexican counterpart, Secretary of Economy, Ildefonso Guajardo, here in Washington. It remains my hope that together, we can find a negotiated solution that works for all parties. If not, we will be required to proceed with the imposition of duties on June 6. On a lighter note, a happier note, I was glad to reach an agreement 
to open our markets to lemon imports from Argentina with the Argentinian Minister of Production, Francesco Cabrera, last month. After a productive meeting between our two presidents, I hope that we can continue to expand the collaborative relationship between the two governments. Our agreement on lemons was guided by the fundamental principle that agricultural exports to everywhere should be based on science, not protectionist ideology. We believe that all agricultural decisions should be made solely based on science. Beyond the specific cases mentioned before, we generally intend to become more aggressive in pursuing trade remedies. There's little point to a trade agreement that's not honored. Commerce has long had the power to self-initiate proceedings, but very rarely has done so. Self-initiation speeds up the process considerably because otherwise the industry needs to organize itself and develop its case over many months and at very, very large cost. Then commerce spends more time reviewing the facts before the first actions can take place. Self-initiation eliminates the first of those steps. And another benefit to it is that it dilutes the offending country's ability to pick out an individual company for reprisals. We at Department of Commerce will stand shoulder to shoulder with American businesses to end such games. We will also routinely, we will stop routinely granting waivers of statutory time limits because the dumpers claim to need more time. Cases take too long and no company should die because relief was too slow coming. Once we have a decision, rest assured we will be effective at collecting the corrective duties. On coming to this office, I was horrified to learn that billions of dollars of such duties had gone uncollected despite rulings in our favor. The president has now fixed that by empowering Customs and Border Protection to require importers to put up collateral before bringing in such goods. We also intend to revisit trade agreements with the principal objective of increasing American exports. In our view, the best way to improve balance of payments and stimulate the economy is to reduce barriers to those exports. But another way, which may be particularly relevant to countries represented here, is to have our trading partners give us a higher market share of products they already buy, both from the United States and from other countries. Those steps will increase total trade among us while reducing our deficits. We intend to raise tariffs or create non-tariff barriers only if other negotiating tools fail. But other nations must understand that we will use all the tools at our disposal if necessary. Most of you have expressed reservations about our withdrawal from the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The fact is, there simply was no political will on either side of the aisle for the TPP, so its demise was inevitable, regardless of who won last November's election. But there were some good aspects to TPP, and as we negotiate further agreements with TPP signatories, our intention is to retain some of those features particularly as they pertain to market access and try to push others even further. The gains achieved in TPP will not backslide. The only question will be now, how much better can we protect American interests? One way to achieve this 
will be to favor bilateral over multilateral trade deals. The President and I both have concerns about multilateral agreements in general and are generally skeptical of the theory that multilaterals necessarily lower geopolitical tensions. Multilateral trade deals, by their nature, take an extremely long time to negotiate because they have so many moving parts. And often, as a result, they are somewhat obsolete by the time they're signed. Worse yet, when someone has spent eight years negotiating an agreement, they can become too invested in the process and too tempted subconsciously to settle for a deal rather than for the deal. My personal experience in negotiating hundreds of deals is that the probability of a balanced deal varies inversely and exponentially with how long it takes to negotiate it. There's another inherent structural problem with multilateral negotiations. Let's say I'm the US and you're Japan, and I insist on improved agricultural access. In exchange, you as Japan are gonna want something back from the United States. Since we would also be negotiating, say, with Vietnam, and we would have something we'd want from them, they would naturally want something back from us. Now what happens is, in this hypothetical multilateral deal, Japan and Vietnam would each end up both with the concessions they requested and concessions someone else requested. Well, by the time you do that a dozen times, you're negotiated to death because we have the most to give being the biggest of the markets. This is not to say that multilaterals can never work, but simply that we will focus on bilaterals. We should be able to create symmetry so that each takes us to a similar place without the risk of a smaller player extorting everyone else. You remember the famous situation with the Canada-EU agreement where a small province in Belgium held the whole deal up over some specialized issues. NAFTA is a bit different in that they are, will be working from the framework of an existing trilateral. We have not yet decided whether to go the trilateral route or to pursue two matching bilaterals. And in fact, we don't think that's the most important question in any event. At this early stage, we're focused on substance rather than form. When we do approach trade negotiations, our first priority must be our nearby neighbors. And importantly, our CAFTA DR free trade agreement has performed pretty well. And as a lot of you perhaps remember, I have been a big advocate for that agreement when I was back in the private sector. In terms of CAFTA DR, there have been relatively few disagreements and we have generally modest surpluses each year. But nonetheless, any agreement could be updated to reflect the changes in all the various economies and to correct unintended oversights in the original deal. NAFTA, at the other end of the spectrum, is at best out of date and at worst did not accomplish some of its most important goals. To the best of my knowledge, none of the forecasts that have been made as to NAFTA's effect on the countries of the United States and to some degree Mexico have actually come true in the real world. And so the president has directed us to begin the process of reopening discussions with Canada and Mexico. And he also said that I would play a leadership role in that process. The next mile marker will come soon when we will issue the 90-day letter to Congress 
of our intent to begin formal negotiations with our NAFTA partners. That's when the clock starts ticking in earnest. Our intention is to use our trade promotion authority, the so-called fast track, because the legislative process doesn't really match private sector speed. For instance, the Senate has been slow walking the confirmation of Bob Lighthizer for U.S. trade rep. They refused to accept our 90-day notification so long as we did not have a confirmed USTR, but then they failed to confirm him. This likely will be resolved this week. I know there has been much apprehension on both sides of the border as to what may be the outcome of NAFTA negotiations. This has been especially true of businesses in Mexico, of the U.S. agricultural industries, and of those multinationals with facilities in both countries. We all know that business executives hate uncertainty. It's very hard to plan, especially capital expenditures, when you're not sure what the rules will be. We're keenly aware of this problem and will work to conclude the talks as soon as possible. Toward that end, we will seek a far more aggressive meeting schedule than has been the norm historically. Mexican Foreign Minister Luis Vildegaray Caso was quoted as hoping for a conclusion by the end of the year. Once we get going, I'll promise you this administration will not be a source of delay. And as I said at the beginning, our primary objective is to increase our exports and to end unfair trade practices that hamper them. There will be situations where we will need to impose duties or tariffs, but our trading partners must understand that we are doing so simply because we seek to negotiate free and fair trade agreements. So now we must execute on those goals. It is my hope that in the coming months, we in the administration, as well as many of you in this room, can work collaboratively to improve both total trade and our trade imbalances where they may exist. I thank you all for your attention, and now we'll take a few questions if you promise not to make them too hard. So uh, let me ask uh, for questions from the floor. I'll kick it off then. Um, so our company, mining company, depends on global growth, right. free trade, fair trade is an important component of that. Like others, and I think you were in this camp at one point in the business roundtable, we supported a TPP. Uh, we recognized as the campaign was going, like you said, there was no way for it to survive the presidential campaign. Now people talk about a vacuum that's been created because the U.S. is not part of TPP, China was not, and now China's talking about this uh, Silk Road concept and so forth. Uh, could you comment on sure. how that all fits together in your view? Sure. Well, the One Belt, One Road, or OBOR, as we in acronym Happy Washington tend to refer to it, OBOR is not a free trade agreement. It's really more a transportation concept, re redoing some infrastructure projects that have been discussed for quite some while. But one thing, is, and it may be very helpful in terms of fixing infrastructure in some of those countries, but it is not a free trade agreement. And given the protectionist nature of a number of those countries, including of China, I would be very surprised if it morphs into anything like a real free trade agreement. So I, I don't think it's comparable to the TPP 
in any event. Plus, there is some sort of a movement uh, to have a non-U.S. version of TPP under some other sort of acronym. And if that happens, we had, I don't think we have any inherent objection to it, but we will be pursuing with the major countries their individual agreements. And we don't see anything logically inconsistent uh, about doing that. The issues with each of those countries uh, have some very great differences among them, even though they also have some degree of similarities. But we are concerned that we think it'll be much quicker and much better to do a series of matching bilaterals. And to make that process simpler, we're hoping to have some key elements to it on things like data localization, on other and dispute resolution, things of that sort that shouldn't have to be renegotiated every time you have an agreement, uh, uh, foreign direct investment protections, things of that sort should be pretty well standardized. That would then mean the individual bilaterals could be quite tailored in their other provisions to the specifics of the relationship between the two parties. Anyone else? Yes. Secretary Ross, my question is about the Exim Bank. Um, in, in South America, we see very active uh, Exim Banks from Europe, um, from other countries, but we rarely see the United States Exim Bank. And if you'll permit me a remark, it, we, I find it a bit strange us importing John Deere tractors with the assistance of the Brazilian Exim Bank. Made, the tractors are made in Brazil because uh, we can't get them from the U.S. because the Exim Bank doesn't want to play. Um, do, w will the Exim Bank likely have any role, or is that something you've considered yet? Well, uh, I'm, I'm a fan of the United States having an export-import kind of a facility. Um, and as you know, it was reauthorized by the Congress, but then there was quite a delay in filling the vacancies. The president has proposed two nominees to fill the vacancies, and while there are some controversies about them, the fact is he's proposed two candidates. The reason those two are important is, excuse me, without those two additional seats being filled, the Exim lacks the quorum that it needs to execute loan transactions of more than $10 million in an individual case. So for big projects, it's pretty well hampered right now. We, we hope that those vacancies will be filled soon. I've been participating in the uh, Exim board meetings because Commerce is an ex officio uh, member of it. And I think it's quite essential as a competitive tool that we have a functioning international finance mechanism. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the 232 investigation on aluminum, and, and the reason for the question is really the integrated supply chain with Canada and aluminum coming from Canada and sort of, I mean, it's, it's not an often used uh, tactic. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about the goals. Sure. Well, why don't I talk about both the 232 investigation that's underway in aluminum and the one that's underway in steel because they're both relatively related. First of all, these are investigations that are underway. They have not yet come to a conclusion. In each case, there is a public comment period that we're in right now, and in each case, there will be public hearings. On the case of steel, it's around the end of May, and the case of aluminum, it's a little bit later, because that was a subsequent one. So no decision will be made until we've taken into consideration the public comment and the testimony at those hearings. But the rationale for bringing them is, is several fold. First rationale is that economic strength, we believe, is very much a relevant factor to national security. Number two, that 
on the specific products that these two industries put forward have very, very clear defense implications. It's very hard to build battleships and aircraft carriers without steel. Very hard to build airplanes and missiles without some steel. And even in the case of, of aluminum, there's, we are now down to where there is only one smelter in the U.S. that makes aerospace quality aluminum. That's an obvious national defense issue. So we feel both at the macro scale and in a macroeconomic scale and in terms of defense itself, there are some potential implications of it. How far to go with the 232, how, how many products to include, those are all things that one will have to decide after we hear the inputs from uh, the outside community. But in theory, what a 232 would permit you to do is it's about the only time you can treat things globally when it's a national defense issue. Otherwise, under the uh, existing uh, uh, most favored nation clause at the WTO, we're stuck with everybody with the exact same tariff. And that was well-intentioned. It was intention to prevent discriminatory activity. But what really has evolved over the years within the WTO is something quite different. U.S. is the least protectionist of the major countries. You'd never know it from the way the press talks about it, because every time we do the slightest thing to defend ourselves, they scream protectionism. Whereas many other countries with whom we have deficits, most notably China, Japan, and the EU, and Korea, are much more protectionist than we are, although they're much better at using the free trade rhetoric. But our objectives are to get the rhetoric in line, uh, get the actuality more in line with the rhetoric. So we're exploring whatever tools are legislatively already available to us to try to deal with the problems. Both steel and aluminum have chronic global overcapacity, and those are problems that must be dealt with. And some of the uh, providers of that overcapacity, notwithstanding periodic public statements to the effect that they'll deal with the problem, they don't. They keep increasing their capacity. In a normal free market economy, you would not keep blindly increasing capacity in a market that's already oversupplied. Take, for example, in steel, the, the amount of unused capacity there in China alone is more than twice the total capacity of the United States and is about twice the U.S. total consumption. So these are gargantuan dislocations that are way out of whack. But it's not just China. There's oversupply in those products uh, everywhere. Um, so we are trying to use whatever tools are already available but have not been used in order to try to deal with the situation. And the reason we're reluctant to get to the Congress is as you've seen in your daily papers, this is not exactly a bipartisan uh, situation that faces us. So anything that requires congressional approval is relatively an uphill fight, even though when you think about it, a degree of protectionism is more in line with normal Democratic Party policies than it is with some Republican Party policies. But that doesn't seem to matter in, in the present environment. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate it. Thank you.